And so the first step is to be fearless like the fool who stands on the edge of a cliff with a radiant white sun, white is the color of purity, just like the purity of the highest level of spiritual potential is shining upon the fool, creating a golden yellow background our mind expands to the highest level of intelligence when we have this spiritual awakening symbolized by the white rose that he holds in his left hand. This spiritual awakening requires us to awaken our intuition, symbolized by the left side of the body. He wears on his head the Greek laurel wreath which is a symbol of victory, and the red ostrich feather belonging to the goddess Ma'at, goddess of truth, divine order, and justice. Red is the symbol or color of passion and energy, vitality, and courage. We awaken a consciousness that guides us by following what it is that impassions us, that gives us courage so that we can take the risk and go forward. Hence, we become spiritual champions. He wears a garment of white with a cloak of green and pinwheels of radiant creative energy. White is again the color of virtue, the color of spirituality. That is what is closest to us. And it is our own capacity to grow creatively that guards us and protects us on this journey of the soul. He wears upon his feet golden yellow boots. Every step we take is a reminder that we are supported by the highest level of intelligence. Every step we take. At his feel, heels, is a white dog, symbolic of a purification of our animal instincts. We human beings are born into animal bodies, and if you were to stand at the edge of a cliff, chances are you would have an automatic stress response. A fight, flight, freeze, faint, instinctive response. These instincts can be purified. And when they are, our instincts are then in service of a greater virtue, a spiritual perspective that guides us as a companion along this mystery into expanding consciousness where we don't know what's next. But we recognize that we take with us the symbol of the rod carrying a satchel with an all-seeing eye the symbol of spiritual insight, power, and resource of our psychic intuitive capacities. Within the satchel of the fool, he has packed everything he needs for this journey. And we find what it is that he has packed because in the next card we discover that the tools that he has packed away are on the table. The wand, the goblet or cup, which is the symbol of the heart. The sword, symbol of the mind, the creative mind, and the coin, symbol of the body, and the power of our instincts, health, vitality, and aliveness. These are the tools of the persona or the ego that the magician has before him as tools to be picked or chosen through the direction of his gaze, he determines which is the appropriate tool at any given situation. But it is not determined by his ego. It is determined by an infinite consciousness symbolized by the infinity sign above his head. He holds in his right hand a wand of power, a scepter that has flames on either end. Sometimes you might feel like you're burning the candle at both ends. <laughs> However, it's also a symbol of light from above is reflected in that which is below. 
It is that knowledge of how everything is a reflection that he reaches consciously and actively symbolized by the right hand to a higher intelligence and becomes a channel for that, directing his left hand, his index finger, to the ground below, where you see a garden full of white lilies of virtue and the red roses of passion. And you'll notice that these roses that frame the image of the magician are below and above. Again, symbolic. That that which is above is a reflection of that which is below. That everything in our physical world is a reflection of greater universal truth and spiritual principle. And, of course, another symbol of the eternal quest that we are on to discover how to awaken our consciousness is symbolized by the snake biting its own tail that he wears as a belt on his white garments. We, too, awaken consciousness, a consciousness that is eternal, that grows and goes through changes, just like the snake which sheds its skin and renews itself again. He wears a cloak of courage, vitality, and aliveness, the color red. Next, we move, and on your decks, instead of wearing a verdant green dress, the empress is wearing a dress that is made out of the veil of the high priestess. And you'll notice the pomegranate symbols on her dress. Now the empress is the one who wears the mystery of creativity, who is the embodiment of that right action that brings harmony, balance, and beauty into the world. She's the only pregnant card in the deck. She has the crescent moon under her foot. The waters from the high priestess now are irrigating her field of wheat, which is coming to ripeness. She has a symbol of Venus on your cards. It's a symbol with the Venus sign, the circle on top of a cross. The identity of wholeness in this world that is a blend of spirit and matter. In this card, it is the dove, which is the symbol of love, the goddess of love, on the heart. What you'll notice also, and I'm just going to pull your card out because so, it's the ones you're working with. She has on her head a crown with 12 stars, symbol of all of the hours of day and night. She too knows the mystery of timing of the soul and she comes to fruition in terms of her pregnancy at just the right time to nourish and nurture whatever it is that is being born in consciousness. Ask yourself, what am I giving birth to? The fool asks, do I trust? Am I ready to risk? Am I fearless? Magician, can I direct my attention into the form or the, the tool that will bring about the greatest result according to a higher wisdom. Can I enter into the mystery, the high priestess? What is the mystery here that is being revealed? How do I be with the unknown? And then from that unknown, what is it that is being born? We also have in the Empress card, she is holding a scepter in her left hand. The hand of intuition holds the power. Again, the scepter of power with the circle with a cross on top, or in yours, it's just circle on top. The power of spirit that brings wholeness to the individual. She is the symbol of love, of unconditional acceptance. There's nothing that doesn't fit. Because she accepts herself so completely, she has integrated the dark and light poles of the emperor, of the high priestess. She understands the mystery of yes and no, and is comfortable setting boundaries and limits, saying yes when she needs yes, and no when she needs no. And she's also comfortable hearing yes and no, knowing that there is a time and a place for everything in existence. The cypress trees in the background are also a symbol of the goddess Venus. This tree was sacred to her. And as an evergreen, there is a symbol of that 
ever green, eternal life, which is always renewing. In order for the Empress, and again, I'm going to now just do the Hebrew letters. Aleph is the sound before existence, a silent letter. Aleph is that potential before we give birth, before we enter, that allows us to risk. Bait is the symbol of a house, the structure, the form that we are, so that spirit can fill us. Gimel translates as the term gamal or camel. We carry our resources with us. And so we are able to navigate long stretches of mystery, knowing that we can determine what is appropriate. Dalit is the door. Delet is door. The Shekhinah, or the feminine, this powerful presence of love, is the doorway that allows us to bring our gifts into the world. And with his power and energy bringing balance between the worlds, we then enter into the mystery of the High Priestess, where we recognize that no matter how conscious we become, there are still things that we're unconscious about. There are still things that we don't know. There are still surprises positive and negative experiences, and the mystery of how come we have to deal with positive and negative, no matter what. How is this a part of the universe? What is the wisdom or teaching of finding the place of balance, poise, and harmony between the poles, the opposing poles? The way we do that is noticing the figure of the High Priestess in the center. She wears the beautiful deep blue color, indigo, of intuition and spiritual mystery. On her lap she holds a scroll which has written the letters T-O-R-A, Torah. Torah is the Hebrew word for teaching or instruction, or law. She understands the teachings, the wisdom, the law of universal of the relationships between these polar aspects. She understands because she has opened her mind to the resources of intuition, symbolized by the crescent moons going in both directions, and the full moon at the center, she understands the mystery of time, of cycles, seasons, patience, and process. Behind her is a veil that contains pomegranates on the print, pomegranates that are full of seeds, the fertility of the mystery, the infinite possibility where anything can be born. There's a story in the Kabbalah that there are 613 seeds in a pomegranate. Mm -hmm. In Jewish custom, there are 613 deeds or guidelines that direct us how to live in harmony and balance according to divine law. 365 of them are the do's and the rest are the don'ts. <laughs> <laughs> I should also mention that most of them apply to men. <laughs> Seriously? And the reason is because it's taught in Judaism that women are closer to the divine source because of our capacity to give birth. And there are very few laws that women are required to, to follow in that same way because by nature there is a sense of contact with the rhythms and harmony and balance of the universe. Chauvinism. <laughs> I used to argue it. As I age, I'm beginning to embrace it. <laughs> Behind her you'll notice a sea representing the depths of the unconscious mind. And the midnight blue sky, now you'll notice the brilliant yellow expanding consciousness and intelligence that is shining in the fool and present in the magician is now the ground of being in the high priestess. And the contrast between conscious and unconscious or subconscious or shadow consciousness is what this card brings forward. The mystery of how these polar aspects bring us into birth, into growth. 
the next step is to balance again masculine and feminine by protecting that new life that is coming forward, being strong enough to be able to set the boundary and limit, to determine what is right for you, the sense of direction. The letter hey is the window where we are able to perceive what it is that opens us to new directions, new horizons. Where is it that that new life needs to go in order to flourish? The emperor is associated with the sign Aries, which is the risk taker, the pioneer, the champion, or the warrior, but not in the terms of war as we know it today, but the spiritual warrior, the one who is connected to the empress in the Celtic mystery teachings, this would be Arthur and Guinevere, the land and the one who protects the land. Same metaphor. On the throne of the emperor, we see the sign of Aries, which indicates again leadership that comes from being willing to take a stand that nourishes and nurtures and supports that new consciousness that is being born. He holds in his right hand the scepter of power. He initiates the stand, and the scepter of power that he holds is the Ankh symbol from ancient Egypt. He holds life in his hand. He supports the power of life. Today we have a term for that, it's called sustainability. This is about sustainability long before it became fashionable. In his other hand, he holds a globe symbol of wholeness, presence, and power, and the symbol on the globe is that regal presence and power. Again, we have the stream in the unconscious floating through the background. He sits on a, a, a stable uh, throne, which is a four-sided throne, whether it's on a cube or in the form that you see it's on your card, which is creating structure and foundation. Likewise, the green is the sign of growth and fertility. He creates a structure and foundation that supports whatever it is that needs to grow. And his color is this radiant, brilliant orange. He's willing to take on the power of leadership, to be the one who takes a stand. And the magnetism of drawing to him the resources that are needed in order to support the life that is growing. Now, for the first time, after we have established ourselves in this way, we are ready to begin to interact with others. You'll notice key five, the hierophant, associated with the letter of love, is the first card where we suddenly are no longer a solitary figure in the center, but we have people, other people. The hierophant wearing red robes of courage, passion, and vitality, with an undergarment, again, of pure white, spiritual intent, purpose, and innocence, stands before two monks. The monks in this card are wearing the red roses of passion and the white lilies of virtue. The hierophant, the word hierophant literally means sacred stories. How are we delivering the teachings, the stories that bring forth the uniqueness of the soul or the consciousness that is awakening. The number five is very specifically about that awakening self. And what is so interesting is that we return now to being between two pillars, but the pillars of the high priestess, which were black and white, are now shades of gray. We have learned the wisdom of the universe and are disseminating those teachings but what is true is how those teachings are received will depend on who's listening, and they will be interpreted based on the individual as they hear them. We have also the scepter of power now in the left hand. It is by staying in contact with our intuition that we disseminate the spiritual teachings. We have a crown of higher consciousness, we stay connected with that greater conscious awareness. We hold the keys of knowledge, but we also acknowledge 
that the true teaching is experience. And so what we deliver, these two who are listening will have to discover for themselves. The number five, numerologically, is a very interesting number because it's the cross point between everything that has been created and the traditions and structures and forms that have come before and the need for self-expression. Each human being, if you look at the way we stand, we are like a star, a five-pointed star. The number five is the awakening of your own inner light. And so it is that there's a conflict or contrast between the traditions of the past, the stories that were told to you from your ancestry, your family, your culture, your religion, and whatever it is that is seeking to be expressed within you from the radiance of your consciousness. It is in this place that you begin to reconcile those forces and discover, based on your own experience, what is true for you. What is the teaching for yours? Which then brings you into the next part, the lovers. Now that you are interacting with others, how do you interact with others from a way that is true to you, that is in right relationship with others? The lover's card tells us how to do that. And the image and symbol of the card shows us the formula. First, we allow ourselves to be vulnerable and naked. The man is looking at the woman, our masculine principle, outer objective mind and intellect looks to the receptive, subjective, feminine principle of our emotions and intuitions. The emotional, intuitive self looks up to a higher agency, a spiritual force or source. In this case, the angel Raphael. We ask, what is it that would bring healing to this relationship? What is it that would bring wholeness? What is it, tell me, that would support the greatest good for myself and this other? And then the angel will speak. And then we take that out. And then we communicate. So this card is about right relationship that is based on making choices, remembering to turn inward, to make our choices not just based on the tree of knowledge, which is knowledge of duality or good or evil, like the polarities of the high priestess, but also based on the tree of life. What is it that will bring life? Now that I know the positive and the negative, the pros and the cons, what is it that will bring life? What will bring wholeness? What will bring healing? The angel Raphael is wearing purple, which is the color of spiritual leadership. Let yourself be led by that which makes you whole and brings healing to yourself and others. The word Raphael literally translates as the healing face of God. That's who we turn to for guidance in this place. Then we are able to walk on the ground of creativity, green grass, letting growth and creativity guide us to the purple mountain on our spiritual journey. Mountains are symbols of spirit, and purple mountain is how do we enter into spiritual leadership? How do we walk that path? Well, now that we've learned how to become whole, we're ready to really go out into the world, and we now meet the chariot. The charioteer is the one who takes the teachings forward to others. The charioteer, you'll notice, is on a stone chariot being drawn by two sphinxes, the dark and the light. What is the wisdom of the dark? The anger, the hurt, the frustration, the, the things that we don't like. There's a mystery in that. There's a teaching in that. What is the mystery of the light? The radiance, the positive, the joys. Where do those fit in terms of moving us forward in the world? We have learned how to make appropriate decisions, and we now know how to move with these forces in a way that moves us forward. The method is symbolized by the crown on the head of the charioteer. He wears a crown, and on yours, he's wearing a laurel wreath that is crowned by four stars. Again, spiritual victory. The laurel wreath, 
with the four stars, the stars are the jewels of the following resources. Intention is the first sparkling star. Intellect is the second sparkling star. Thank you. Intuition is the next star. And imagination. So how do we take these? What does that mean? When you know your intellect, your intention, where it is directing you, follow that. But that will take you into the world and you'll start looking at the pros and cons, the good, the bad. Use your objective intellectual mind to evaluate the ups and the downs. Then use your intuition to perceive internally the pros and the cons, what's appropriate for you. Now you have all of the facts and figures and the internal awareness. Use your imagination to be able to perceive how to bring all of these together in a way that will meet your ultimate intention. This is the crown of the champion, the enlightened mind or the higher intellect that is guiding the sphinxes between the positive and negative experiences. He wears on his shoulders the Janus moons. He knows about the experience of emotion, about intuition. He knows about the happy and the sad experiences. They do not block him. They are not a barrier for him. He allows himself to move forward step by step. He wears a shield, and if you'll notice on your card, that has a beautiful square right over the heart. He is stable within his own heart. He knows how to create a structure, a form that allows him to move forward. And he is under the canopy of a radiant star, all of the starry sky. His infinite possibilities are open to him. And he goes in the direction of his highest level of intention. Again, he moves along the green grass of creativity and growth. Behind him is the city, and it's the first time we have a city. We are here to bring our life out into the world, to share it with other people. It's not just for ourselves. He's the hero that, talk, that Joseph Campbell talks about in Hero of a Thousand Faces. And between him and the city, is the water of the unconscious. We must know how to traverse all the terrains, the ground, the water, the sky, and then again, the fiery intelligence of this brilliant yellow light behind him. We need to work with every element within our being in order to move forward and fulfill our mission. So what happens as we move forward, we have accomplished our goals, then, without a doubt, we move to number eight, where different experiences start emerging. The feeling of beauty and the beast. <laughs> what are the beasts that arise? What are the passions, the, the intense experiences that will push on us or pull us or devour us? We must find a way to tame those passions, to make sense of them. Card number eight is associated with the Hebrew letter tet. The letter tet is the letter that is the first letter of the word tov, which means good. Within our passions, or what might be considered the shadow, whether it's the positive shadow or the negative shadow, whether it's the things that support us or the things that detract us, there's a wisdom there, there's a teaching there, there's goodness there. We find what is tov, what is good, and that is what tames the fears, the anxieties, the patterns of the past, the conditions of the past. Eight is always a number of power. How do we empower ourselves so that we can then empower others? How do we delegate? How do we use power? And the card tells us how. Again, we access creative growth. We remain on a spiritual mission and symbolized by the purple mountains in the background. We continue to expand our consciousness to that highest level of intelligence, symbolized by the infinity sign above her head. Now the laurel wreath is actually flowered. 
And so we too allow our consciousness to flower. This moves us forward then to the nine, the hermit. We recognize that there's a certain amount of growth that happens that we must do by going deep within ourselves. It's not about just going out, but as we do this inward journey of making peace with ourselves of power, we find ourselves now at the mountain tops, way off in the distance, wherever there are mountains. We now have discovered that we need to bring our own light with us. In the lantern of the hermit is the star of David, the double pointed star. We find a way to balance our fire, our water, our air, our earth, all of the elements of our being, our masculine and feminine. We find a way to bring illumination that can guide us, which is on the mountain top. Having satisfied, made peace with our issues of power and being able to contain, work with in a way that is compassionate, gentle, kind, bringing through infinite resource, this blossoming of insight and awareness, there is then an inner illumination that dawns. We become aware that we have to go within, to take time and space for ourselves in order to complete this journey. There is a time and a place for everything. And sometimes there's a time for solitude, for reflection, for inner learning. The hermit is the one who helps us awaken that inner knowledge or insight. He walks on the white mountain peaks, which is the symbol of that highest level of spiritual awareness. Being at the top of the mountain, you have the biggest, broadest perspective. Likewise, he holds in his left hand <laughs> the wand of power based on his intuition, his perception, his psychic resources. He uses that to support himself as he walks the spiritual heights. He has in his right hand a lantern. The lantern has a star of David in it, which is the symbol of the blending of opposites, like the yin-yang symbol. That which is reaching up, that which is reaching below creates a radiance of its own. Within our own nature, we have this aspiration and a desire to integrate and bring into the world. So as the hermit, carrying our own light, in the midst of the mystery, in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the midnight sky, is able to find peace, there's completion. The number nine always represents how is it that we come to completion? We move from number one all the way through number nine. Nine is a universal number as well. It's a number of humanity. It's a number that we begin to recognize that we move beyond the individual self, out in the world. And one way we can understand this is like the existence of crisis. Every single one of us has a journey that only we can make. And in that, we are all alone. However, in that aloneness, we discover that this is where we are all alone. Every single one of us has to reconcile our relationship to these mysteries. And having come into a place of new insight, knowledge, and understanding, we start a whole new level, which is based on the Wheel of Fortune. The Wheel of Fortune happens to be one of my favorite cards. It's the card of getting off the Wheel of Karma. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know how to do that, and if you happen to have picked the Wheel of Fortune, mm -hmm. this is an opportunity for you to turn your consciousness around, consciously shifting. The way you do that is you'll notice, now I want you to look at your cards. In the corners, you'll see a man's head that represents Aquarius an eagle that represents Scorpio, a bull that represents Taurus, and Leo the lion. In your card, you will notice that they're all reading books. They're reading books because they are learning the lessons that these four signs offer. Aquarius is the sign of the intellect. 
Scorpio is the water or emotions. Taurus is the bull of earth. And Leo is fire. In astrology, there are three principles. There is the cardinal principle, there is the fixed principle, and the mutable principle. The cardinal principle is the energy of Aries that initiates. The fixed energy is the energy of Taurus, which holds sometimes in a somewhat stubborn way. Mm -hmm. The energy of the mutable sign is the sign that shifts and changes like Gemini. It so happens that Scorpio, Taurus, and Leo are the fixed signs of air, water, earth, and fire. So you are asked if you want to get off the wheel of karma, how do you get stuck in your mind? How do you get stuck in your emotions? How do you get stuck in your habits, patterns, and routines? How do you get stuck in your pride and vanity and arrogance? <laughs> I know what's right and it's all up to me and I want your adoration. <laughs> the Leo energy, I'm the one. Well, focus. So the question becomes, I don't want to offend any Leos, <laughs> because there is the transformative energy of each of these. In the Aquarian mind, where we can get into very rigid thinking, instead we transform the mind by opening into the ideals, the aspirations, and the humanitarian perspective and principles that are behind our beliefs, ideas, attitudes, and beliefs. We universalize. On the emotional level, instead of getting stuck in our anger, frustration, grief, sadness, we are like the eagle able to fly high above and gain perspective on how these feelings inform us with a sense of value and how the emotions are signals about what's important to us. And Taurus the bull, Instead of getting stuck in habits, patterns, and routines, and wanting things just so, we instead learn, how do I really support myself? What is it that really nourishes me? What is it that I really need? And can I create a structure that will support that new life and new growth? And then Leo, instead of becoming arrogant and prideful and vain and leading the limelight or um, approval from others, we recognize that there is simply a radiant light of creative force that is moving through. And having learned what that light is, can I allow the spontaneity of that creative force to be expressed in the form that it seeks and to be able to be a carrier of that? When I have learned these lessons of my ideals, my perspective and values, the ability to structure my life and express my creative spirit, I'm able to get off the wheel of karma. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So much easier said than done. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we do it? We have here the wheel, we have a little demon, we have a snake, and we have a sphinx. Well, this is the mystery of how to do it. Mm -hmm. Like the sphinx, we know that every experience we have has wisdom. We hold the sword of discrimination, which is a double-edged sword. One blade is the blade of the intellect, which looks at outer facts and figures. One blade is the blade of the inner perception, which looks at those inner signals. When we look at our thoughts, feelings, habits, and patterns, and creative expression, we begin to determine the wisdom of what it is that's going on. And we slice through Whatever it is that is bedeviling us, what is that little demon that we are attached to? And we learn then, like the snake, to shed its skin and to let go of whatever it is that's needing to be released so that we can then move forward in a new way. That's the formula. Then you'll notice here the wheel itself has the letters T O R A, Torah, again. We move in relationship to the teachings of universal law. That is what we align ourselves with. Also, inside the Wheel of Fortune, we have the Hebrew letters Yud, He, Vav, He. 
you might recall I mentioned that there's an unpronounceable name for the infinite source, the mystery, the great mystery of life. That's yud Hey above Hey. And so we understand the teachings of the universal law of this great mystery. That's what allows us to move in get off the wheel of karma by aligning with that greater force. Mm -hmm. If this card shows up for you, it could be that within the next 10 days, 10 weeks, or 10 minutes, or 10 months or 10 years, <laughs> <laughs> you will have the opportunity to release some kind of experience. Likewise, it may be that you are having an opportunity in the next 10 days, 10 weeks, 10 minutes, 10 years, or 10 months to create an opportunity or to maintain and sustain an opportunity. Remember, cardinal, fixed, immutable. Create, sustain, or release. Anytime we pull a card, ask, is this something I am creating right now? Is this something I am establishing or sustaining in my life right now? Or is this something I am releasing right now? Huh. And so, let me look at the question of number 11. 11 is the card of justice. Justice is symbolized by the goddess Ma'at, which was the symbol of justice and truth in ancient Egypt. Behind the justice card, we see that radiant yellow golden light we attain the highest level of intelligence and all find that place of poise and balance. In the left hand, let me make sure I'm doing this right. In the left hand, I hold the scale of balance. Balance between inner world and outer world. As we move into the double digits here, we are taking all of the lessons and we begin to interact at a higher vibration, as though we are agents now of social, cultural, spiritual evolution for the awakening of humanity. So justice requires that we come first into alignment with ourselves, and then we can act as a force for justice in the world. We wear the robe which is a color of red vitality, courage, takes courage to be one who yields and yields justice, with a, the um, border of green, which is about creativity and growth, holding in the right hand the double-edged sword, once again, of discrimination, using intellect and intuition. On the crown is a golden uh, diadem, which is recognizing that we have to awaken to the highest level of consciousness in order to perceive that universal order and balance, that the access in the wheel of fortune to heal and release our own karma, we learn to become an expression of that quality of harmony and balance in our interactions with others. It's also interesting, it's associated with the Hebrew letter Lamed. Lamed literally is Lamed, which is learning, teaching. So when we learn the great mysteries and teachings of the universe, we come into order, into alignment with what it is that brings that greater sense of harmony, balance, and perspective. And so it is that we are then able to disseminate justice not so much by what we say, but by who we are. Which then, of course, takes us to the 12th card because we discover, this little roll card keeps. <laughs> Sign of the times. That's what's happening in our world. <laughs> no accident. Um, we realize that the world as we knew it is probably just the opposite of what we thought. The world turns upside down. We have to get a whole new perspective on things. We walk through the world with our heads up. The hangman says, turn it upside down. Everything that we think, there's a good point, a point along the journey of the awakening of the soul where everything is just the opposite of what you thought. Anybody have that?
<laughs> Isn't that wild? <laughs> Just the opposite of what you thought. Things are not the way they seem. Wow. And how many people are taking the world at surface value, surface level? But there's a deeper mystery when we've gotten this far along, we see things differently. There's a golden halo around our head. We have that expanded highest level of intelligence informing our consciousness. Notice the way his legs are shaped. He's um, standing like this. This is the symbol of Saturn, which is the symbol of limitation and principle, teachings of how is it that we bring into form the um, and reconcile the tests and challenges of this physical world. So um, that's the Saturn here. If it were up this way, which we find on the world card, the opposite, <laughs> the legs are going like that, that's the symbol of Jupiter. We finally expand into the world. Remember, Jupiter is the symbol of expansion. However, the reversal is true at this phase of the process. So when you start realizing that everything is just the opposite of how it seems, you might go through an experience of contraction, an experience of, how can that be? And the number 12, particularly the hangman, is requiring you to look at what are your hang-ups? What are the things that you got stuck on? Particularly, were there any issues around martyrdom? Any issues around sacrifice? Any issues around um, overextension? Remember we talked about the unconditional love of the empress? Well, until we really get that unconditional love means also loving our limits and boundaries, we can tend to overextend and give ourselves away. The hangman says, that will not do. <laughs> We need to sacrifice that instead of sacrificing our spirit. We need to sacrifice that convention. That's what conventional wisdom and conventional social norms suggest. But until we have ourselves, we can't really give to another. We end up depleting. So again, this is a, the perspective. Things are just the opposite of what we think. We have a tendency to make a lot of things important that aren't so important. It just, as we learn from our world exemplar, it happens. We get distracted by all of the things going on in life. The death card says, death to distractions. <laughs> Whatever is not important is removed. Whether you want it or not, there comes a point in the journey where what really matters is all that remains, and inessentials fall away. And if we are grasping or holding on, it can feel horrible, absolutely horrible. I had an awakening this last month as I was eking out my chapters during writer's block. And I realized, remember I had talked about the different gateways to awakening, that there is being in the presence of a teacher. Oh, how wonderful to receive Shaktipat. Where just by being with a teacher, you awaken to the reality. And I know some of you have had that experience here. But not all of us have that opportunity. So most of us do one of these four other gateways. We go through the experience of spiritual discipline. We do our practice. We do it every day. We do our yoga. We pull a tarot card every day, <laughs> whatever the practice is. And if we stick with it and we don't let anything distract us, we can awaken. We get an insight. Likewise, sacrifice is another gateway. The letting go of what is inessential, and I really think that anybody who has been a parent has chosen the gateway of sacrifice as a way to awaken. Because you must put yourself aside if you are really going to be there for the sake of another being in their growth and development. There are many forms of sacrifice. I think another form of sacrifice that awakens us in these days is overcoming addictions. Alcoholism, cigarettes, you name it. You must sacrifice that in order to 
walk in a way that is true. And in that process of sacrificing that which is inessential, you awaken to what is really true, what is essential, and you discover a different universe. Sacrifice and discipline are two sides of the same coin. Now another one is the path of trauma and tragedy, when trauma and tragedy act as a teacher. Now we're getting down, you see all of these in the death card, don't you? Sacrifice and the discipline of doing what is really essential. Trauma and tragedy, when it looks like things are being taken away from you and you have no choice but to surrender. Anybody ever have that experience? <laughs> We've all experienced all of these cards, every single one of us. So we learn what matters and what doesn't matter, what's real and what's not real. The last gateway is the pathway of bliss. The pathway of bliss, oh, how many of us wish for that pathway? <laughs> The tantric traditions are about that, using erotic sexual energy or pleasure to awaken and to get a glimpse of what the universe really is, that freedom, that what the Dalai Lama calls ultimate happiness, that there's an ultimate happiness. I remember when I was studying with the Dalai Lama at the Kala Chakra teaching, he said, you know, in our world, in the world of conditions, we have good and bad, our likes, our dislikes, our reactions, happy, sad. He said, there is this other place that's beyond that. The Kala Chakra is all about touching the place that's beyond the cycles of time and conditions. And he said, that place is beyond good and bad, happy and sad. But if you want to know what it feels like, it's, it's closer to happiness. That's how he described it. It has more of that quality. That's the path of bliss. We connect with the reality of and I do believe we had several people here in our check-in today talk exactly about that. I remember Peggy saying when she was talking about the hangman, you know, and it's really not so bad. <laughs> it's a good stretch to be in the hangman position. And then uh, Janine was talking about, yeah, in Mexico they actually celebrate death. It's playful, it's light, it's birth. So what I discovered this last month, and I'd like to share this with you, Resistance and bliss are two sides of the same coin. Resistance, when we approach death card with resistance, it hurts like hell. When we approach the death card with surrender, it's bliss. It's like, oh, thank God I don't have to pay attention to any of that anymore. <laughs> it's done. Even if I want to, I can't because it's been taken away from me. Now what happens at the death phase, in, it's associated with the Hebrew letter nun. The Hebrew letter nun, and it's associated with the symbol of a fish. I think of this as associated with that same quality of um, the fisherman of the soul. And who who has our nun? Do you remember what it said in the in your little reading here? This is by Edward Hoffman. I highlighted something for each of us. So the nun. Yeah, right yeah, if you could, and I'll, I'll re uh, maybe you can come up so you're closer to my, if you don't mind, oh, but then you're going to be on the tape. Maybe I'll read it, actually. Okay. Representing the number 50, Nun symbolizes faith and its vibrancy in spiritual life. Nun is the Aramaic word for fish, denoting great fruitfulness and indicates that faith brings us a sense of abundance in our daily life. So in the letting go, we discover a great creative potential. This is symbolized in the card also by the sun rising in the background. The sun is always a symbol of creative potential, just like the sun brings life and fertility to our planet, so death brings life and fertility to the human soul and psyche. Likewise, death does not discriminate. Everybody is subject to this energy. Doesn't matter if you have power or position, king or queen or pope, doesn't matter. None of those externals matter anymore. We have the figures of a woman, 
a child, symbolic of our receptive nature and our creative nature. We have the flag that has on it the symbol of the white rose. This is also the white rose that was associated with the plague. Again, the plagues, the things that bring us death, are no longer to be feared, but rather embraced. And as we release into them, we discover an eternal quality of our soul, which was what our magician was telling us about earlier today. So we have in the background the waters of the high priestess's robe. We are still connected with the wisdom of the subconscious mind, the deep flow of the universe. We're connected with that as things fall away. And there's a boat here to carry us. Sometimes we wonder how we're going to traverse these passages. Somehow, supports come when we least expect it, if we let go of how we think it's supposed to look. We re are required when the death card comes to let go of our preconceptions, to let go of the habits, patterns, and routines that we used for security, to let go of those emotional securities that we thought were our foundation, but instead to learn to go with a flow, that's the emotional, and on the intuitive, perceptual level, to let go of whatever barriers we had to trusting ourselves, but instead to cultivate faith. This is just as the fool required us to take a leap of faith, this is the next level of the leap of faith so that we can take our journey, not just the inward part of the journey. Up until now, very much the journey has been inward transmutation and transformation. At the death card now, it goes to an even deeper and subtler level, but it feels more like it's about interaction with externals and outer world. Although you've noticed that that's true at every case, whether you're dealing with the empress and family and love and giving yourself away or needing to love yourself, we are always interacting inner and outer. They're really mirrors of each other. But the death card, it's really obvious where it's something that seems like it's outside of our control, from the outside, is removed. If you're renting a home, it's like you get your eviction notice. <laughs> it's that kind of really radical, dramatic piece. So now that we've gotten down to the bare bones of what really matters in life, whether we wanted to or not, <laughs> our soul then gives us an opportunity to connect with experiences of opposites in a way that transforms our perspective on life entirely. This is the fiery angel, Michael, Michael, mi kamocha el, who is like you, O source, infinite one of the universe, el. El, by the way, is spelled Aleph Lamed. <coughs> who is like you, O one who risks everything to go for the heart? <laughs> Michael. That's the energy of temperance. And we begin to find that there's a blending of opposites. And that's OK. Instead of being caught going pole to pole, suddenly we're in a new state of consciousness that can hold opposites. And it all makes so much sense like tears of joy. Anybody ever experienced that? Opposites. How can tears and joy go together? Ah, mi kamocha el. Who is like you who goes to the heart and can see things from a new perspective? The pouring of the waters of life back and forth, back and forth, no longer this or that, but something new emerges. I keep one foot like the angel, deep in the subconscious waters of potentiality. 
hidden from view. I yet somehow maintain my other foot on the solid ground of earth. If this card shows up, ask yourself the question, how am I holding the paradoxes in my life? Have I allowed every element or aspect, like the rainbow, to be transformed, to have a place and a space that illuminates and radiates its own distinct colors? This is the blending of fire and water. The rainbow is sunlight coming through mist or haze fire and water creating beauty. Usually fire and water put each other out. You put fire under water, it boils and evaporates. Gone. You put water on fire, it douses it. Gone. This is a different creative potential that is only available after we've gone through the surrender of death. That there's another way that illuminates the full spectrum of our experience, as our temperance card related to us earlier. We have the irises in the background. Iris is the Greek goddess of the rainbow, another symbol of the same thing. We notice that the path comes from the depths of the subconscious. The path, the journey of the soul, is golden consciousness, bright yellow, coming into an intelligence. There's an intelligence that guides our way along the path of our own awakening through the fertile green hills. It's hilly. Don't expect that it's going to be a straightaway. <laughs> As we enter now, we continue to find our way up and down until we achieve a highest level of consciousness, symbolized by the golden crown rising over the purple mountains of nobility and spirituality. This is a journey in which we discover and attain the highest level of consciousness that we then bring forward. But what ends up happening at this next phase of the journey is we think we've got it made. We've let it all go. We are now so illumined. And lo and behold, we discover we have a few attachments. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the devil. The next angel who shows up is the one that says, what's bedeviling you? What are you still attached to that you thought you let go of? The devil card is card number 15. It's associated with the astrological sign Capricorn. It has the Hebrew letter ayin associated with it. The Hebrew letter ayin is a silent letter. There's another silent letter, which is the Aleph. These are the two silent letters. But the silent letter Ayan is a silent letter that comes from your throat. It's a guttural silent letter. It catches. So if I were to say, for example, Aleph, it's Aleph. If I were to say Ayan, it's Ayan. Ayan comes from deep. This is what catches you. Ayan. Ayan also represents this and means the word I. The eyes are you looking. Where are you looking? Where do you still get caught? It has to do with your perspective. And so what we notice here is that the devil card and the lover's card are <clears throat> deeply connected to each other. We notice that in both cards we have two naked figures, a male and a female figure, standing beneath a spiritual, supernatural being. In the lover's card, lo, it's the angel Raphael, healing angel. From the devil's card, it doesn't look like an angel anymore. <laughs> Why? It's because if we look at the cards, we'll notice that the man has his eyes closed. Our intellect, intelligence, directed, focused awareness is not paying attention. And the female, our receptive, intuitive, emotional nature is no longer looking up for guidance on 
what is it that will bring me wholeness and healing, she's looking out to everyone outside of her. Just take a look at the cards and notice where she's looking. I'm looking to you for approval. I'm looking to you for agreement. I'm looking to you for confirmation. I'm not looking to the sources that can really bring me the wholeness and healing and health that I quest. And so I get detached to what you think or what you feel or your responses or reactions. And the attachment is symbolized by these chains around the necks. But notice the chains are big. These chains are not binding. How easy would it be to lift that chain and take it off? Very easy. We have on these two figures the same symbols that we have with the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. The tree of life stands behind the man and his eyes are closed. He's not looking to what is it that brings him life. We must direct our focused attention on what is it that brings me life. And she, instead of focusing up to higher knowledge and wisdom, symbolized by the angel, is instead looking outside. And she gets caught in the judgments of good and evil. The tree of knowledge is not about good and evil. The tree of knowledge is simply knowledge about what is. We are the ones who interpret it as good or evil. And that's what we do when we are no longer connected with the power and radiance and warmth and fire of life, symbolized again by the fiery bush that's associated with the tree of life. The devil has his torch down. Instead of being illuminated, having light above, we have taken our light and lowered it. We are no longer finding our way. I sense that this is the fourth archangel in reality, Uriel, the angel of light. But the light can be blinding. And so we are looking in the wrong places for the light. We look outside ourselves instead of inside. In order to go further on the path at this point, we must discover where the light really comes from and where it is. Hence, we enter the next card, card number 16. Lightning! <laughs> the flash of light. Lightning is the only celestial light that builds a bridge between heaven and earth. There is an awakening, an illumination that shocks our consciousness. And we go, oh, it's not where I was looking before. This is associated with the sign of Mars and the Hebrew letter Pe. Pe is pe. It means mouth. It translates as mouth. It's very interesting. The pe is made by a Hebrew letter. I don't have a really beautiful pen here to make it lovely, but we'll do it this way. Called chaf. The Hebrew letter chaf which you might recall is the Wheel of Fortune. How do we turn our words around that come out of our mouth? Well, it can be like the letter, the, the symbol of Mars. We direct it out. It all depends on what we do with our tongue. The arrow is like the tongue. It can be harsh and fast and aggressive, or it can be soothing and calm and compassionate. The tongue can go in many, many different directions. The tower card is related very much to the death card because both of them are about that coming down to what's true. Actually, you'll notice this whole path is starting with the knowledge of the truth that we discover in justice that is in relationship to a larger universal sense of order that turns our world upside down that brings us down to what's really essential in life, that allows us to move beyond the dualities. And we recognize all of the places that we got caught so we can free ourselves. The Tower card is the act of self-liberation, of freeing ourselves. 
And the means and method that we free ourselves is in the words we speak. The words we speak match the higher illumination and intention of a greater intelligence. And so our actions, our words, and our inspiration or intention match. The letter pay, which literally means mouth, is this capacity, like the chaf, to turn the wheel around, the wheel of fortune, by taking the tongue and turning it inside the mouth. The pay looks like that. It has a little yud that goes in, and it makes the sound pay. Actually, it's one of the double letters. The pay to really sound like a p has a dot in the middle of it. Without it, it's a ph sound. But that's beyond what we need to lo know here. So the holding the tongue until you're clear about what you want to say so that you can turn your consciousness around to the most creative potential, come from the heart, bring your light into the world, make the stretch, let go of inessentials, be able to hold a space that's larger than this or that. Let go of your attachments to outcomes. Then speak. Speak the truth. You don't even have to be harsh or directive. Just speaking the truth will send people flying out of the tower. <laughs> Anybody ever notice that? <laughs> it happens because it awakens someone when we speak truth and we are coming from the heart it can shift someone into having to do their own journey we may have suddenly turned their world upside down it may feel like it's happening to them if they're lucky they will take that as an invitation to begin their own soul's journey of awakening we serve to awaken each other, but it's not personal. I'm not here to awaken you. How many of us have gotten caught in that trap? <laughs> I know I have. It took me a long time to realize that, you know what, I don't have to teach people anything. Life is the teacher. Life is the teacher. So this is the card where we begin to get it. Life is the teacher. <coughs> All I have to do is speak what I know to be true from my own experience having traveled this far. The tower is a symbol of human construction. You'll notice that most of the cards do not have human construction. The ones that do are the charioteer and the tower. We do have a couple pillars we have a chair to sit on, but it's not like something that humans dwell in. So the challenge for the 16 and the 7 is how do we interact with the constructed reality of conventionality in a way that brings forth the truth of the champion that travels through the world with wisdom and allows us to act as illuminators for ourselves and each other without taking that on as a zealous mission. It's simply natural. It happens by accident. It's not something you have to force or make. So Mars, when it's not skilled, is the forcing, thinking you have to make it happen or the direction versus the allowing it to happen. You speak truth, things change. Direction happens. That's the mystery teaching of the tower. That takes us then to the vulnerability of the star card. The vulnerability of the star card. The star, like the temperance card, is pouring the waters of life back and forth. The star dips deep into the waters of the subconscious. She returns to the pool, and you'll notice the pool shows up in a few places here. It's the same water that comes from the trails of the high priestess that runs through the background of the empress 
and the emperor. We see the water again showing up. Where are we? Here in the death card, moving again into the temperance and now into the star card. So if you want to take the next level, pull those cards out that have water in them because they contain a mystery of how is it that we bring our light into the world. We are at peace and composed in relationship to the polarities. We are connected with self-nourishment and self-nurturement that empowers us to act as an advocate for a greater intelligence that allows us then to do the hard work of letting go of inessentials so that we can recreate our lives based on a foundation that is beyond duality, either or. So that we can then, after we have done the hard work of speaking truth, nourish ourselves again. We must remember to take time to support ourselves by dipping into the waters of life. And we take the water from the subconscious, the creative, intuitive, um, subtle signals, and we fill the ground of being with this deeper insight and awareness. You'll notice that there are five little rivulets of water pouring out into the ground. Fill your senses with the subtle awareness of the soul. So this is when we now recognize that everything in the physical world is actually a representation of spiritual principle. Everything. And we begin to see with our eyes, but also with our inner eye. And we hear with our ears, but also with our inner ear. And we smell, and we taste, and we touch, and we recognize that everything is symbolic and metaphoric of a greater teaching that can bring us light, illumination. The eight-pointed star is associated with the angelic realms. In many indigenous cultures around the world, the Basque culture, for example, is one that I know also from some of the aboriginal cultures. Also, um, if you go back to tracing around about the roots from Atlantis, there's this statement that we come from the stars. We come from the stars. This particular card is associated with the sign Aquarius and the Hebrew letter Tzadi. Tzadi. Who has our Tzadi here? Can I read your little portion? Tzadi begins the Hebrew word for righteous, tzaddik, describing one who follows the precepts of Jewish ethics. For millennia, the sages have affirmed that tzaddikim, that's the plural for tzaddik, so righteous people, are those whose spirituality is never secluded or secreted. That's why she's naked. We show all. <laughs> but rather eagerly embrace friends, family, community responsibilities. From this perspective, the tzaddik is one who brings down the lights from the heavens into this rocky, mundane world. There's a wonderful Jewish story that I want to share with you. It's called the story of the Lamed Vavniks. Lamed Vav stands for Lev. And again, Lamed and Vav just to kind of keep that in mind. The one who comes from the heart and is a, on the path of the mastery of the soul and to bring through spiritual teaching. In Hebrew, Lamed Vav equals the number 36. 36 is a very special number because it's double 18. We haven't gotten to 18 yet, which is the symbol for life. The story goes that, you know, there's an old, old story that... Um, when God was deciding to destroy the world, first he did it with Noah, but he saved Noah and his family. Then he came to Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham talked him out of it. And so he saved those few righteous people. 
And then the story goes that there were in the world 36 righteous people. And every time God gets really whatever God means, remember it's that great mystery, L. Whenever that mystery goes, wow, I don't know about this. I think it's time for destruction. Let's start again. <laughs> <laughs> Vancouver, right, <laughs> like brown water. Yeah, let's start again. So what happens is, on the merit of these 36 Lamed Vavniks, it's said there are 36 true tzaddikim, truly righteous people bringing in the light as it was first inspired and meant to be brought in. They're here in the world, and it's on their merit that the world is still here. And we don't know who they are. It could be the milkman. It could be the post office person. It could be the, the woman or man who cuts your hair. They're very humble. You never know who these Lamed Vavniks are. And it's on their merit that the world is here at all. So that's what this, and do you feel the energy of that radiance, that goodness, that humility, that light? That's what each of us is. That's what this card is about. Each of us has a guiding star. And we are here to bring that star to Earth. What I love about this card most, as I was studying it, one of the pieces that I read was that because Tzadik also translates as fish hook, the eight-pointed star symbolizes that invisible realm, the realm of angels or beings that are beyond the physical human dimension. And we call to them for help when we're on this journey, because let's face it, we need help, you know? <laughs> what we realize when the star card comes is that just like we're reaching up, they're reaching down to help. The fish hook. They're fishing for us, to help us, and we are never, ever alone on our journey. There is always help. That's what the star card reminds us. We finally awaken to that at card number 17. It's beautiful. And it happens from being our authentic self, our vulnerable, naked, human, frail self, we connect with something universal, and in that universal connection with what it means to be human, we awaken to humanity, and we become agents of humane ways of being. Lamed Vavniks in training, each of us. The way we do that is we then have to access the creative power of the moon. The moon is an amazing light. It's the third light in our series of illumination. The moon represents emotions, intuition. It changes. How do we respond to change? Most of us respond like animals. What was that? <laughs> Dig a hole and go down, hide, yeah. The, the four animal responses to change are fight, flight, freeze, and faint. Anybody ever do any of those? <laughs> On the emotional level, the fight, we all know that one, the attack mode. Or the blame or shame or whatever, I mean, it's the same. The, f the fight. The flight mode is how we run away, and we run away in our minds, too, by telling ourselves all kinds of interesting stories that may or may not be true, as opposed to just being present with what is. Fight, flight, freeze. The emotional response for freeze is that feeling so heavy, so stuck, you can't move. You can't even get out of bed in the morning. Anybody ever feel that way? That's called depression or grief. And the last one, fight, flight, freeze, faint. Faint is what possums do when they pretend to be dead but they're not. Anybody here ever play possum? <laughs> also known as the rope -dope. The what is that called? Rope-a-dope. Rope -dope? Muhammad Ali used to do the rope-a-dope. Mm -hmm. Be on the ropes pretending to be tired and beat up and let an opponent exhaust himself. Ah, uh, mm -hmm. 
Well, that's good. <laughs> it's a good strategy, actually. These four, fight, flight, freeze, faint, are strategies for survival. And this is the card that shows us our evolutionary path. We start as the crustacean that comes from the water, the lurking in the deeps, this unevolved part of us. Anybody have that? <laughs> we all do. At some point, we climb out of the depths of the unconscious, and it crawls on to the path of conscious awakening and spiritual journey. And we become aware of those very base animal elements within our nature. And we then next to need to recognize the wild wolf part of us and the tame domesticated dog. How many of us have been tamed and domesticated and conventional? How many of us have these wild aspects or elements? We all have all of these parts of ourselves. And we learn to grow and evolve and continue on the path of evolution. Notice that the path goes up and down hills, up and down hills. It's not a straightaway. It is not Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is something that you really have to work at different phases and stages. But it's fertile. It's green. It gives you new life, new possibilities to consciously be on this golden path of awakening consciousness. And at some point, you come to the part of the path that is between the two towers, between the conventions of social construction, of what we as human beings have created. Just like we have the tower here that we had to deconstruct, at some point on our evolutionary journey, we move beyond those kinds of conventions of social construction. And it's at that gateway then that we enter into the indigo mountains, the mountains of intuition, of spirituality, which guides us then to the mountain peaks of our enlightened, awakened awareness. The moon represents emotions. It represents what nourishes and nurtures us. It represents our intuition. It is the reflected light of the sun. If the moon shows up, you need to ask yourself, what do I need to reflect on? Where am I on my evolutionary journey? What deep unconscious part is coming forward for me to view and love and accept and bring on the path of awakening? Where am I in relationship to my wild and conventional tame self? Where am I in my creative path? And what have I created? And how has it limited me? the conventions of the towers. It is through the process of reflection and repetition that we discover a greater truth that comes to us through the moon card. You'll notice that there are 15 little yuds here. The yud is that hand of God, that pure spiritual light that's awakening us. 15 is an interesting number. I had to do a lot of research to discover what this meant that had meaning for me. Now, as you know, I, I really love the ancient Egyptian teachings. The moon is frequently associated with our desires as well because of the emotions. So happens that in ancient Egypt, you know, in English we have soul and spirit, right? We have bodies and minds occasionally. <laughs> but that's about it. In ancient Egypt, they had nine bodies to describe who we were. Nine souls, spirits, minds, and bodies. One of them is called the heart, eb or ab. The heart is the desire body. It is one of the higher bodies. It is through our desires that we are guided and motivated and moved through life. There's another body called the ka. The ka is, I'm going to give you an example of the ka. Close your eyes for a second. And now get an image of yourself. Take a moment and look inside. And as you perceive yourself, notice the feeling that you have towards yourself. Notice if you have any judgments. You might notice what you're wearing. 
or how old you are or how young you are. Notice all of the qualities about yourself, if it's positive or negative. And when you open your eyes now, just take a moment to reflect. Everybody get an inner image, picture of yourself. Who you saw is your ka. The ka is like your double. Now, it so happens in ancient Egypt, there are 14 ka's, not just one. They reflect our desires and our aversions, the parts of us we like and the parts of us we don't like, our shadows and our radiance. How many of you liked what you saw? How many of you criticized yourself when you saw? All of that is part of the ka. What are you reflecting on? That's the mystery of the moon. Whatever you're reflecting on, whatever it is, it's part of your evolutionary journey to help you awaken. So be like the moon, the mother. Nourish, nurture yourself. Support yourself on these inner reflections. It's associated with kuf. Kuf is the letter that is the back of the head. How you think about yourself makes a big difference. How you reflect internally on yourself. It's associated with the sign Pisces. Pisces is that universal love that knows that we're all connected, that we're all growing. So let your reflections be loving. <laughs> See if you have those negative reflections, that they're a reflection of where humanity is. You're not alone in having those. Every human being is growing through all kinds of places. And lo and behold, we really are innocent, like the little child. We move from the reflected light of the moon that gains insight and understanding through self-reflection. And we purify and clarify our desires so that the desire is for this journey of evolution that takes us beyond the constructions of standard social convention. And we recognize that we are, the notice on his head, a garland that is now fully flowered. This is the garland that the fool was wearing at the very beginning. Our consciousness has now fully bloomed. And we recognize our innocence. Fully empowered, symbolized by the white horse, our power has been purified. We recognize the virtue of being an expression of many universal forces. And we hold the standard of courage and vitality as we go forth. The four sunflowers are symbolic of the emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual world. And you'll notice here that the stones behind the fence are symbolic of the structures of reality that are all imbued with spiritual potential. We notice that it is built in the color of gray, which is the color of wisdom, that our world is constructed as a reflection of the wisdom of the universe. We notice also that the sun itself, and I remember I've counted these in the path, but I'm going to have to do it again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good, my memory serves me. Just want to make sure that I wasn't making that up. We have ten straight lines and ten wavy lines. Ten is the number again of the tree of life. And so the radiant consciousness shines through Eleven. each of. Eleven. Eleven. Did I miscount? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, the wavy ones are ten. Just to the left of the number, the numerical symbol that you left, that's the eleven. Where is that? One, yeah, that no. two, three, four, five, six, so seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> yeah, <Straight>. ten <laughs> wavies, eleven straight. <laughs> Okay, so the wavy lines, the ten wavy lines, are symbolic of the light penetrating through the ten spheres of the tree of life. So that there is the illumination 
through each of the spherot. The light is shining through our consciousness. If we add all of them together, we end up with 21, which is going from 1 through 21. And of course, we know that this little guy is the fool in his innocence, the naked child. I'm sorry? That's too funny. What's too? That was the card I pulled, and I'm in sun already. Yes. That was the card I just pulled today. The fool? Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> so you see how the cards interconnect. It's like shoots and ladders. And so now that we are innocent and we're fully empowered with our animal instincts, the horse, as well as our spiritual instincts and creative intelligence, the sun, we allow our light to shine on every blade of grass. Like the sun, we are not discriminating who I'm going to shine on and who I'm not. We just allow ourselves to radiate and emanate the creative potential that we are here to bring to the world. We then move forward into a state of rebirth and resurrection, which is the judgment card. The judgment is card number 20. It's associated with the sign Pluto and the Hebrew letter Shin. Oh, I should mention also, the sun card is associated with the Hebrew letter Resh. Resh means Rosh, Rosh is head. It also means like beginning, like the head of the line, you would say. So this is really the beginning of the conscious awakening, and we start innocent. Isn't there an expression like that, only as children shall ye enter, etc.? So that's again another reflection of this universal teaching. When we have that innocence, we can then be reborn. Notice all of the figures here are coming out of coffins, and they're all the color gray. We are born into a wisdom. We are reborn. Male, female, child, our intelligence that is directed, concrete, objective, male, receptive, intuitive, emotional, female, creative, innocent child, born with its own wisdom, gray. No longer black or white, but the color gray is the wisdom color. We are floating on the sea of consciousness. We are born from the depths of a much larger intelligence that flows, again, from the robes of the High Priestess all the way through. In the background, we have here on the far shore land that moves into mountain peaks and caps, the same that the hermit is traversing on his journey. We, too, recognize that we are here in the world, born anew, listening to the call, which is a spiritual call from the, this particular angel is the other fourth angel in, in the Major Arcana. This is Gabriel. Gabriel is the angel. Gever is strength. Givura is one of the spherot. Do you have the strength to be your spiritual self? Gabriel is the strength of El. Gabriel, the strength of that infinite creative mystery, inspires you with a calling in life. And we have the flag here with the color of Mars. We direct our energy, our vitality, our courage equally, internally and externally, the equidistant cross is the internal and external domains. We listen within and we act in our world to bring through the power and wisdom of our calling in life, which of course acts as a transformer. Pluto is the symbol of transformation. It's interesting because the word shin literally means teeth. And sometimes it's a big bite to chew on whatever you're called to do. And we are given the resources to be able to chew on it, to be able to do it, to be able to speak it, to bring it through. The Shin is a very powerful letter. It's one of the fire letters. It's about being an agent of transformation, not by being judgmental. That's not what this is about. This is about spiritual discrimination, doing only that 
which really allows you to fulfill what spirit wants from you. And you notice that it's related to this line that comes from the truth of the heart and is connected with that larger mystery of the sublime order and beauty and balance of the universe that the High Priestess represents. That's what our calling is related to. Which brings us into a whole new world. We recognize, where is my 10? Where, 9, 10, here we go. So these two cards, you can see how they're related. In the early phase, we've learned the lessons of how do we move beyond rigid thinking? How do we move beyond getting stuck in negative emotions? How do we move beyond the limits of our habits, patterns, and routines? How do we move beyond our pride and ambition and instead tap our creativity, tap our deeper sense of values, tap whatever it is that truly moves and motivates us so that we can create those ideals. In the world card, we now become the manifestation of those ideals motivated by what it is that is transformed and true in a way that brings our creativity through, in a way that honors the reality of our lives. Aquarius, the man, the thought, the eagle, transformed emotions, lion, the transformed creative spirit, and Taurus the bull, our transformed relationship to our physical bodies and the world. We are within the beautiful garland of the world. This earth is the garland of beauty. Ah, definitely. I also saw this as the womb. And especially if we look at the empress, which is the energy that this is really representing, we start in the womb of the empress, and then we enter into the world, and the world is our womb. We have an opportunity to explore and experiment and create living what's really true, what our calling is, letting our light shine here in this world. We now have not one baton, but two, because we recognize that on the inner journey, we are discovering the truth of our oneness. But as we come into this world, we enter a world in which things appear more dual and dualistic. And we learn how to handle all of those experiences. We wear um, a scarf or a drape of purple, of nobility, of spirituality. We bring our spiritual purpose with us into this world in our vulnerable naked truth. And you'll notice also that many of the interpretations, I personally think of it as a female figure, but many of the interpretations suggest because the genitals are hidden that it could be a hermaphrodite. We don't know for sure if it's male or female, although it looks pretty female to me personally. Me too. Yeah. What can I say? But that's what the ancient, some of the, not the ancients, that's what the more contemporary teachers suggest is because the genitals are covered, it could be male, could be female. And especially, you know, I lived in San Francisco for 20 years, it could be a he, she very easily. <laughs> but really, it's about the experience of the mystery of our creative process, which is still covered. The genitals are always associated with creativity, whether they're male or female, they're creative. And that still is not completely revealed. How is it we're going to create this world? It's not revealed yet. That's the mystery. And so these four represent then also the quality of the four suits. The swords or the intellect, the Aries, the emotions, the cups, the fiery spirit of the wands, and the earth of the pentacles. We bring our power and resources into the world. In January, we're going to start looking at those resources. <laughs>